And also, of course, here's the number seven oxygen. One thing that students have trouble doing is figuring out where this oxygen came from. So that's why I think it's helpful to put this number here on this oxygen. This oxygen ends up in the ring. Here's our number six over here. Oh, now the next thing we have to figure out is which substituent should be pointing up and which should be pointing down. Well, basically, for the stereo centers, anything that's on the right should end up down. We're just going to memorize this uh, mechanically without working it out. You could always build a model to confirm this. But all, uh, for each of the stereo centers, any group that's on the right ends up down. So on the number two, should the hydroxy be up or down? Down. So I'll put it down. How about on the number three, should the hydroxy be up or down? Up. So I'll put it up. And then on the number four, the hydroxy should be? Down. OK. Now for the number five, that method doesn't work, because this oxygen ended up in the ring. So we're not going to do that for the number five. Where should I put the alcohol group here? Because theoretically, I could have put the alcohol group pointing down. Well, again, we'll just memorize for D sugars, um, the bottom stereo center, the alcohol always ends up pointing up. You might have already noticed in the pictures in the book that this CH2 group is always pointing up in those because you're always working with D sugars. So for a D sugar, the substituent on this carbon will always oh, be pointing up. It's an L, it'll be down. It'll be pointing down. That's right. That could come up on the exam. So it's perfectly possible for an L sugar that you could have the substituent down here. But for a D sugar, it'll be up here. So we're just doing some mechanical memorization. For a D sugar, this will be up. But yeah, what's on the right will end up down. Or, and what's on the left will end up up. Of course, if you wanted to, you could also put in the hidden hydrogens. For example, here on the number two, the hydrogen is to the left, so that should end up up. On the number three, the hydrogen is to the right, so that should end up down. But it's usually probably better to leave the hydrogens out just because it clutters up the picture. All you really need to do if you're thinking in terms of bond line notation is put in the alcohol groups. All right, so now this is the right picture. Uh, by the way, this, does, this doesn't only work if you started with a, uh, a six-membered sugar over here. This would also work for any number. You just get a bigger ring. You just get a bigger ring. This group at the bottom would be always be up for a D sugar. And all these stereo centers here would always be pointing down, except for the, 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 the one that's doing the attack. So the number of carbons you have in the sugar is going to be how big the ring is. How mm -hmm. many atoms in the ring? Not always, but it's we'll see some other examples. Like, to make a six Listen, I think that'll clarify when we look at some examples. Okay. Now, the one thing we haven't done yet is put in the substituents on the number one. Who's attached to the number one? An alcohol group that can go up or down. That's right. Why can it go up or down? Because this stereo center wasn't set yet. And what's the geometry originally of this aldehyde? Trigonal planar. And we know that when we attack something trigonal planar, we get both stereochemical out uh, outcomes. So this could be pointing either up. Product should we get? Two. Two. So that should be and. Okay. Uh, that's right. So that was a correction, hiding is a question. So yeah, these should, uh, one of these should be pointing up and one of these should be pointing down. We're going to get both. Not necessarily in equal amounts. There's no reason to think that this will be in equal amounts because these are not enantiomers of each other. They're diastereomers because they only differ at one stereo center. But we will get both because we're attacking something trigonal planar. You, won't, you wouldn't be expected to predict which you'd get in the major amount. Um, and there's nomenclature then for the difference between these two. Alpha and beta. Down. Beta. Yeah, this is the alpha. I don't know if you've heard any mnemonics for that, but I had a student once that said um, alpha looks like a little fishy, and fishies go down in the ocean, and beta <laughs> stands for birds, beta for birds, and birds fly high up in the sky. I always kind of like that mnemonic. <laughs> so. All right, so beta stands for B for birds, that's high up in the sky. And alpha looks like a little fish, which is down low in the sea. So that's our difference between our alpha and our beta positions. So looks like you already had that memorized anyway, but it's more fun to have a mnemonic. Now, um, remember this was D-glucose. This was D-glucose over here. What would we call this? Well, this would be beta D-glucose. Now, we can go even further, though. When it's in a ring, 
There's basically two types of sugar rings, five-membered and six-membered. Six-membered rings are called pyranoses. And five-membered rings are called furanoses. Were those terms that you guys yeah. on class? Uh, just as a mnemonic, the word five starts with an F, and furanose starts with an F. So that helps us remember that furanose stands for five, and pyranose is the other thing, which is six. Normally, we're going to form five or six-numbered rings. Those are the stable rings. So the best name for this is beta d glucopyranose. Beta d glucopyranose to show it came from the D sugar. That's why the number six is pointing up here. Uh, it's beta, and it's a six-membered ring. So you might see a problem in the test that says something like draw beta d glucopyranose. Of course, they have to they, they give you one of the structures to base that. So what would be a good name for this? Beta alpha, alpha d glucopyranose. That's right. Okay, so we've seen how to go from the straight chain form of a monosaccharide to the cyclic form of a monosaccharide. In solution, there's an equilibrium between all of these. In solution, the glucose is constantly fleeting back and forth between the alpha ring, the beta ring, and the straight chain form. But it needs acid to do that? It needs a little acid or base, but there's almost always enough acid or base to do that. Or base. So, um, yeah, you're, you're almost always going to be getting this equilibrium between all of these things. Now, what type of functional group did we end up with at this number one carbon? An alcohol. That's right. But what would we call it when we have this and this on the same carbon? Uh, that and what? Uh, acetal. Yeah. Hemiacetal, now, because you still have one of the OHs. Hemiacetal. Good. Why is it hemi and not full? Well, like you said, there's one OR group and one OH group, so it's half and half. Remember, you would get the full acetal if a second alcohol attacked. Uh, but here we've only had one alcohol attack, so it's hemi acetal. Why is it acetal and not ketal? Because it came from an aldehyde. You can see that because there's this hidden hydrogen over here. So you're right, this is a hemi acetal. These are both hemi acetals. They're cyclic hemi acetals. So generally speaking, um, a, a lot of our cyclic forms are going to be cyclic hemi acetals. When we learned about alcohol attack under acidic conditions on aldehydes and ketones, we said that was a category two reaction, which meant that usually two alcohols attack. But this is an exception to that because, um, because we're forming a ring. So here we're generally just gonna get one alcohol attack. So when we, uh, when we learned about aldehydes and ketones, we said that under acidic conditions, we generally get two alcohols attack and we end up with a full acetal or a full ketal. But sugars are different. For sugars, you normally just get a single alcohol attack, and you end up with a hemiacetal or a hemiketal. So that's one difference from what we learned about aldehydes and ketones before. Um, this is going to be more typically a category one than a category two reaction. What would be a general name for this along the lines of aldo, ketose, or ketose? Ketohexose? Keto, yeah, it's a ketohexose. One, two, three, four times. Ketohexose, is it, uh, but this is uh, fructose. Oh. D or L? D. Because the bottom stereocenter is a D. 
And notice how, as usual, I'm trying to put the carbonyl as close to the top as possible. Otherwise, all our other conventions don't work. Okay, now which of these alcohols could plausibly attack the ketone here? The one closest to the CH2OH. The this one here? Is, yeah. How many atoms would be in that ring? Five. One, two, three, four, five. Good. Okay, so let's draw the ring that we would get from that. Again, if we did this under acidic conditions, we would start by protonating here, and then we would do this. Uh, but now let's just draw what the, uh, the, the ring would look like that we would get from that. 